You are listening to Radio Alamundi. Hi there, wherever you are. I'm Marco Rixiker, a freelance writer, reporter, producer, teacher, translator, tour guide, poet, singer, and songwriter. I speak several languages, and I'm the creator and founder of Radio Alamundi, an evolving podcast station where no language and all languages are spoken. It's a multilingual mix of music, poetry, lectures, languages, interviews, documentaries, recipes, and a lot more, co-produced with the students of the Alamandi International Cultural Center. You can find us on radioalamandi.bandcamp.com, podcasts.apple.com, Spotify, YouTube, Breaker, Player FM, Facebook. Search Radio Alamandi. In Etzer Cantave's voice, Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable's original settlement comes alive and conjures up images of a farmstead with crops such as corn and potatoes, fruit orchards, the inevitable onions and garlic, and fresh meat. The du Sable Heritage Association in Chicago conducts and promotes research on the pioneer who became the founder of the Windy City. Everything and everybody from around the world came through the area that would become today's Chicago. And quite a few languages would have been spoken. French was the predominant language of communication at the time. A multitude of indigenous languages could be heard as well, especially Paduatomi, the language of the tribe by the same name whose homeland Du Sable's settlement was located in. Other native languages would include Adwa, Ojibwe, and Sauk, covering an area between southern Illinois, Indiana, upstate New York, Ontario, and Quebec. And there would be stimulating talk and cultural exchange as part of which people accepted one another. Cultural diversity was not unique or exceptional. It was the norm and part of daily routine. So. The following narrative includes excerpts from a collection of testimonies and interviews entitled Let's Talk About It Anywhere in the World, where it is all about people's voices, accents, and speech patterns, hand in hand with my own personal anecdotes and observations. In addition to that, people are allowed to introduce themselves in their respective, often indigenous languages and dialects, and to speak their minds freely without any paraphrases or expectations. So let the story go on from there. Even before we can chat online, I can sense sort of a calm about Edzer Kantav. Still, the circumstances of our online interview are somewhat stressful. We started about 25 minutes late just because of his sincere efforts to give me the best sound quality. I had told him that we might want to use Skype for our interview, but he has issues logging in, insists for a while, and eventually asks me by email if we can switch to Zoom. And in many respects, we end up being better off that way. Our discussion also benefits from a more convenient and comfortable setting for Edzer, whose inherent calmness and intrinsic serenity quickly return. What helps us through the initial hiccup is that Edzer and I already know each other a little bit and have an idea where this is going in a way. We had already spoken to one another by phone a week earlier, after he had gotten back to me by email asking for an initial phone call. Edzer Cantav is the president of the Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable Heritage Association. Its mission is to inform the general public about the so-called founder of Chicago. In addition to that, the idea is to educate people on the vision of a man who has been ignored for a long time and is still being underestimated as an intellectual. So this interview is about setting the record straight and updating information about a pioneer who settled down near the onion fields at the mouth of the Chicago River. 
Hello, everybody. My name is Edzer Kantav. I am the president of the Sable Heritage Association that is dedicated to promoting the legacy of Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, who was the founder of Chicago. And as we, we are located in Chicago, of course. So it all starts in a typical way. I ask Edzer to introduce himself for the record, and that is relatively straightforward. But then I decide to give things a different twist I know Edzer is expecting some questions, and they will come. But first, I just introduce myself to him as Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable. My name is Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable. I'm a settler, farmer, and pioneer. I like to go hunting, trapping, and fishing. I don't know where I'm from, maybe Quebec, Haiti, or St. Domingos. I live at the mouth of the Chicago River near Lake Michigan. Right now I'm buried in a cemetery somewhere in St. Louis, Missouri. My skin color is black. I like dogs. I like to eat deer stew with white onions and fresh berries. And I like to drink water with that. So Edzer, I got a question for you now. How about that? <laughs> well, you did some research. And <laughs> but there are a few, a few things I'd like to clear up. Yeah, and uh, so that there is no confusion. I know th there was uh, some uh, some issues with the with with disabled uh, and our, our regions, and uh, so that's where disabled heritage association comes in because we had to dissipate all those uh, inaccur uh, inaccuracies about where he came from. He did come from Haiti. I know there was a narrative that he was from Quebec, that uh, he was uh, from some part of the US. Uh, from, no, indeed he was from, uh, from Saint-Domingue, which was uh, 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 the colony that, um, that was the French colony that later became Haiti. He was born in 1745. Uh, uh, to a, a slave mother, a black African slave mother, and uh, a French father. And uh, so he did, um, uh, he immigrated from Saint Domingue uh, first to, uh, to Louisiana, to New Orleans. Uh, he was at age 25. And uh, he stayed for a while in New Orleans, uh, but things started to, uh, to change uh, politically and uh, he had to move up. He had to move up and, uh, to Peoria first. He settled in Peoria for, uh, for about five to, six, five to six years. He purchased land there. Uh, that was his first purchase. Uh, within three years of coming to the to the new world, so he uh, and uh, he had he already had a business. Uh, he already had a mind for business, so he wanted to be, I mean, uh, to pursue a business career. So he purchased land and he started to grow uh, you know, to grow a business there. But later on, as uh, the new nation. Uh, in uh, the United States started to move westward. He didn't feel the security that he was hoping to get. He decided to move up north, up to the Great Lakes region. And uh, so this is where, when you alluded to, to, to he liked uh, to eat deer and onion, Yes, this is where that thing, because Chicago was the land of onions, right? Actually, I mean, the nickname for Chicago, well, the name Chicago is Chicago. There's the many different spelling of that. In the uh, Native American language, it means smelly onion. So smelly onion, because, because Chicago, the land where, where he lived, was a large, 
field of garlic and onion, right? And that explains also why settlers before him didn't want to stay in Chicago, in that area, because they didn't feel that, they didn't deem it a place fit for habitation. Yeah? They feel that, okay, they go, oh, well, it's a field of the smelly onions, you know, it smelled, uh, it's got, it's got a, a bad fragrance, so who wants to, to be there? So the La Salle, you know, the Joliet, the Marquette, they all came through there, but none decided to stay because they didn't feel that it was, it was proper uh, uh, for settlement. But he was the one who decided that, no, this is perfect. And, uh, and this is something that I would say that uh, he, uh, he came with from Saint-Domingue because Saint-Domingue at that time was a very busy part because it was it was French's uh, it was France's uh, richest colony, but not just France's. I mean, it was the richest colony of any uh, uh, colonial power at the time. Yeah. So the part that it came from, the, the town that it came from, called Saint Marc, which was a central, it was a central uh, uh, town uh, on the map on the on Saint Domingue's map it was in the central region but it was a very busy port the port that attracted a lot of ships from France there's a busy activity there so he was there and witnessed all that activity all ships coming from from Europe and then you know bringing manufactured goods right and then loading up with rum you know, rum was <laughs> was something was a very precious commodity at, at the time. So they loaded they loaded up on, on rum, sugar, and, and and coffee, and then those ships would sail through uh, the Mrs. Was, was cross the Caribbean Sea and go up to the uh, uh, up to New Orleans and then through the Mississippi River and all the way up. Uh, to Canada, and then from there they would unload there, and then from Canada they would unload part of this of the cargaison that they, they, that they, they brought from from Saint, Saint Domingue, and then they would load up on 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 things like fur uh, fur coats and uh, uh, codfish, and then brought that to back to Europe. So that was some kind of a triangular commerce that took place at the time. So Dussard, he witnessed all that while in St. Mark, in St. Mark. So when he got to the Great Lakes region, at the mouth of the, of the Chicago River and Lake Michigan, that area was reminiscent of the kind of, of, of the setting that, uh, that, that he lived in in, in St. Mark. So that was a perfect connection there for him. So that was, this is what I want to stay. This is where I want to build my settlement, my community. Right. So that's, that's it there. So that's a connection with, because that, that part of the, you know, of the country, I mean, I mean, there was in that part of the country. There was a flurry of activity of those ships coming from from Canada, going down the Mississippi River, down to the Gulf. That was, I mean, ships would crisscross that area. So he said, "No, this is the place to be, and this is where I will build my business, and this is where I will build my settlement." And there he set. Uh, so the 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 I would say um, the blueprint for what Chicago is today, because that central location, that's location. This is this is the heart of Chicago. If you go to Chicago now, his settlement, uh, that okay, that area where he settled, 
was designated a landmark. And this is where iconic buildings are located. You have uh, the Chicago Tribune, which is, you have across from the Wigley building. And uh, now we have uh, the Apple store and the Apple store sits in the exact location of the Savile's home at the time. So this is something, that's a legacy that he left for Chicago. So this is, this is your central nervous system. This is where things will spring. This is where people will want to be. And Chicago is the third city the nation. And you know, that area called, I mean, you have uh, the, uh, the magnificent mile, right? That runs through there. And you have the river walk on, on either side of the river. They are magnificent uh, buildings, uh, magnificent uh, architectural marvels. So that's what he saw there. That's the potential that he saw by the river when he, when he determined that this is where my place is going to be. And this is what Chicago will be all about. So the fact of the matter is that Du Sable was a black man who originally came from Haiti. And he came to the United States as a free man, while slavery was still rampant and racial stereotypes were common. One can only imagine how difficult it would be for a black man with a foreign accent to get a decent education. But Du Sable was a curious and keen observer, and he saw that the stinky onion fields that would become today's Chicago were at the crossroads of culture and commerce. So he settled down and built a farm where nobody wanted to live, not even the local natives. But Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable saw that goods and commodities were shipped through the area from the Caribbean to Canada and back. Coffee, sugar and rum made their way up north while animal furs and car traveled back south. The mouth of the Chicago River at Lake Michigan was a strategic point between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi. So building a trading post right there was a smart move. Ezra Cantaf calls it the triangular commerce between Canada, the Caribbean and Europe. And Usabel's homestead and trading post was located at the heart of that international triangle. No wonder Carl Sandburg would end up calling the city built right at that spot the crossroads of the nation. Everything was shipped through the area. Everybody stopped by. And doesn't that sound like today's Chicago? Anyway, one thing you could not expect or take for granted if you ran into Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable at the mouth of the Chicago River is to hear English. People spoke several languages, and the predominant European language in the Great Lakes region was actually French. Mix that with du Sable's likely practice of Creole and of several local indigenous languages, and you get a colorful mosaic of wonderful sounds and accents. How would Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable welcome a visitor to Chicago, both in his day and age and in ours? Well, and, and um, you know, du Sable has that affinity for people. He had, because even in Peoria, even back in Peoria, he had already uh, uh, forged some relationships with, uh, with people of different, I mean, backgrounds. And particularly with the Native Americans, right? And uh, so he, because there was, I mean, Chicago is the land of the Patawatomi nation, right? And the, the land, the Patawatomi nation also, uh, I, I mean, the, the, there were many, many tribes in that area, but Chicago itself, that, that which is, is Patawatomi land, 
right? But 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 even in Peoria where he was, there there were some uh, uh, some Patuatomi, I mean I mean uh, natives there. So he had a struck, uh, uh, but he struck a friendship with them. He and and uh, so, so the history is not clear about where he met his wife. So he could have been in in uh, in Peoria itself, and uh, and and this is where he would have married her into a Padawatomi ceremony, uh, and then uh, and then from there, at, at least one kid would have been born there, and he would move up to Chicago. He wouldn't get to Chicago. Based on that relationship that he had in Peoria, it was easy to connect with uh, with the uh, with the Paduadomi and of the Great Lakes region because they welcomed him. They welcomed him because there was something that you know there was some kind of a bond, you know, that uh, uh, both sides you know established. Among them, between themselves, between himself and the Paduatomi, which I mean, translated into into uh, uh, him being some kind of a chief, because because for uh, for a long time he was considered uh, a, a Paduatomi chief. So there was that uh, the. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and his persona being the kind of open person, being the, the, the kind of, you, you know, uh, somebody who gets along with everybody. You know, and then uh, when, when he came to this region, it was easy to strike that, uh, that friendship uh, with, the, uh, with the community that, that was already there. You know, the various, the various, and and uh, peoples, uh, the people nation, uh, those nations, you know, I mean, uh, I mean the Paro the Paroarumi people, uh, the uh, the Sok people, I mean the uh, the I mean the Arawa people, you know, uh, the Ojibwe and uh, the Ojibwe people, as well as the fact that they were part of that uh, the Council of Three Fires. So this is, and they all accepted him, okay, and. And and not only that, they trusted him too because he brought other people, people from even white people, right? People from Canada, people who were fleeing uh, their countries of origin, but he welcomed them and 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 the, the Parwadomi accepted them as well because they trusted him. What could people have eaten in the Chicago River area way back when? Uh, so that uh, I can't really say because you know, not that I'm not going to venture there because mm -hmm. and and uh, and I, I and I have some Parwadomi friends. I mean, who could really? I mean, and, and because there's. Because there is one thing that I mean, uh, there is some kind of a I mean, lack of data, a lack of information, lack of historical data uh, coming from the coming from the region, even even from Dusable himself, because he was an educated man, he was a, a learned man who spoke many languages. But the fact of the matter is, he did well. When I say he didn't leave anything in terms of a diary, in terms of you know, his history, people, you know, then I get uh, uh, a, a historian friend of mine who's going to say, no, you can't say he didn't leave anything because, because the way he left Chicago, he didn't take anything with him. You know, you just he didn't pack anything. He, he just sold his properties. Didn't take anything. So, who, and and we know that his home was quite furnished. It was a furnished home. And people talk about uh, 
I mean, the choice and uh, the choice of paintings that uh, 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 that adorned his home, but he walked away from all that. So um, and 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 uh, so, so I'm pretty sure that there were some uh, you know some books, some manuscripts, or anything that could, and those things did not survive. Did not survive his. Departure from Chicago, and for obvious reasons, I would say because you know because for a long, long time, they tried to conceal the fact that he was the father of Chicago, right? They tried to conceal the fact. I, I, I mean, they they even they even uh, um, where many people claimed uh, uh, paternity over Chicago. One of them was John Kinsey. Yeah, for a long, long time, he was he passed as the father of Chicago. And he's he's the one who inherited Disabled's property. I mean, so so who knows what happened to whatever was left there. So my hope is that someday I will fall upon at the flea markets somewhere. I will fall upon something that you know that was buried somewhere, and then I would, that, that would surface as Disabled's diary, a Disabled right. manuscript or something. You see. Well, but, I, that... but, but to go back to your question, I sure. couldn't tell you the, uh, uh, the, the diet of, uh, but I'm pretty sure that you had a, a good sense of that. I mean, uh, talking about deer and onion, I, I'm pretty sure that was, that was called garlic. That would be part of the diet. <laughs> now imagine you sit down at the table in Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable's farm and he invites you to share a meal with him. You'd enjoy some homegrown crops and produce, some fresh meat, and maybe even a bottle of French wine. Well, I'm pretty sure that a uh, 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 potato would be part of the uh, 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 menu. So onion for sure, and and I'm pretty sure that I mean, uh, but but I said Jisab would have invited me over. I think that okay, I would get. I mean, potato for sure. I would get because and and uh, so he grew crops for that. Um, so maybe cod would be a part of it, maybe. and onion for sure. In the yard. and he had a smokehouse. You know, his business, his, his business. He got the smokehouse. Yeah. So yeah. So I'm pretty sure that we would have uh, and and uh, you know, this is. Uh, 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 a hearty piece of meat there. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And 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 uh, and fruits that would be would, would be part of it because he had an orchard too. That that he so we would have that. So and and uh, and uh, right. So so that would be in my imagination. You know. Uh, and even something typical that, that I would get, and and then of and then of course we would have wine, be, be, because he's uh and 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 he is in his trading post, he received the uh, goods from from all over, you know, and then he and then he he invited his uh, he invited some of those uh, traders uh, uh and. To uh, to stay over because he built uh, uh, guest houses and I'm pretty sure he had he, and and he had wine there so I th I think I would dine to wine as well. <laughs> I can clearly detect pride and passion in Ezra Kantav's voice when he tells me about Dusabel's cultural background and his affinity with the indigenous population of the Lake Michigan Chicago River area way back when. After all, Dusable ended up marrying a local indigenous woman by the name of Kitty Hawa, who belonged to the Paduadam nation. And one of the reasons why Etsu Kantav feels so passionate about that story is that the so-called melting pots of that era were not located in the United States of America. No, they were located in French-speaking and indigenous language-speaking areas such as Haiti, Quebec, and today's Chicago. 
Just the name of the city tells a story about the location of Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable's new home, close to the onion and garlic fields at the mouth of the Chicago River. Chicago comes from the Paduatomi word Chicagua, which French explorers transcribed as Chicago when they first heard it pronounced by the local natives. It means stinky onion or smelly onion, referring to the predominant fragrance that turned out to be too prohibitive for any settlement until Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable came along. Let's fast forward now into today's Chicago and look at this site where the Chicago River flows into Lake Michigan. A bust of Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable commemorates the welcoming pioneer who finally has been recognized as the founder of Chicago. Take a moment and look around as you stand in Pioneer Court Plaza, a name which also commemorates Du Sable. You will see some of the most iconic landmarks of today's Chicago. What is the last Du Sable landmark I should see right before I leave Chicago? Well, Pioneer Court. I mean, you got to go to Pioneer Court and to see and, uh, those buildings, uh, to see uh, the buildings that I, cite, that I cited before. And uh, the Sable Bridge. The Sable Bridge, and uh, initially it was uh, the Michigan Avenue Bridge in, to, in, in 2010 that was renamed uh, thanks to uh, Alderman Riley, I believe. That, so it was renamed in honor of the Gisab, uh, Gisabal Bridge. And uh, so you will cross it and then you would go down the stairs because there's a staircase that takes you uh, from upper, from Michigan Avenue and then go down to the, uh, to the river walk. And that would be what we call the Founders Trail. The Founders Trail would be that base. This is where this basically the path that he, uh, that that uh, uh, where he conducted his business, because you know, and it's recall that uh, it, it, it was named after him uh, in the early two thousand, I believe, uh, Founders Trail. So that was to, and and further by the lake, and there was the Dusable Harbor. So these are things that you can really and 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 see, but uh, there is Lakeshore Drive that has been renamed the Sable Drive. How would you explain today's Chicago to Jean Baptiste Point du Sable? Well, oh, it's it's a daunting task because I always picture him coming back, for, for coming back to Earth and see that. And, and then how he would feel instead of me telling him, going and telling him, okay, let's bring him back here and see, okay, now, what would he feel? Well, I think for one thing, he would be, he would be elated to see the kind of development that, uh, I mean, uh, that Chicago has undergone. He would be pleased to say, okay, but that's the vision I had. I see that. I see, okay, these, this vibrant place, you know, you know, this hub for global business, for commerce, commerce, you know, all over. That I would see. That. Yeah. But how would he feel about anything else? About, I mean, this is when, when he saw, when he would see the divide in the, in the city, because you have, because, because. Chicago is divided along many lines, right? Among racial lines, right? Among, I mean, um, uh, economic lines, you know, and the, the haves and the have nots, right? And geographical lines at the south side, the north side, the west side, and the east side, you know? So that's the kind of thing that just Chicago is as well, you know, is the city of the, 
of the majestic lake front is the city of uh, you know of those iconic buildings those you know those planning those splendid and 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 uh of these architectural feats i would say we can see that but this on the other hand you had that how do you reconcile that how do you reconcile these two but i think this is where uh disciple would have agreed with me and said that okay so we need the Tusabal Park. We need a place like the Tusabal Park. We need to go back to our roots, to what I designed in my settlement. Okay, because this is a because because this is a city that was born of out of diversity. As I said many times, it's a city whose destiny is in its diversity. So, in Ezra Kantav's voice, images of the past are blended with visions of the future. Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable would feel right at home in today's Chicago, especially among all the iconic landmarks near the mouth of the Chicago River, the Tribune Tower, the Wrigley Building, the Magnificent Mile, and the Chicago River Walk, where the so-called Founders Trail allows people to feel like they're following his footsteps in the modern era. And places have been renamed in recognition of the founder of Chicago. There is DuSable Bridge now, from which a staircase goes down to the trail along the Chicago River. It offers some outstanding vantage points to admire the city's architecture. But Ezra Kantaf also makes sure that there is no reason to look at things through rose-colored glasses. He points out that Chicago is divided along many different lines, racial lines, economic lines, and even geographical lines between poor suburbs, no-go areas, and fancy neighborhoods with their condos, parks, scenery, and frequently gorgeous views of Lake Michigan. So what you can see and experience in today's Chicago is the result of the vision of a man whose cultural heritage Etzer Kantav, the president of the Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable Heritage Association, actually shares. And it reflects cultural diversity and acceptance, as well as different perspectives of history. No wonder I can detect pride and passion in Etzer's voice. What is your cultural heritage? What is my cultural here? Okay, well, but I'm Haitian. Right? So, and like to have we are we bring in uh, uh, the Haitian culture, which we are very proud of, I mean, the, the history of Haiti, and all that. And 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 uh, so so that was the first battle that we had to wage, and 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 to assert. The fact that okay, Dusab was of Haitian descent, was a black man of Haitian descent. This is right. So, so that was the first thing we had to have people accept. And Dusab, because as we said in the beginning, there was a narrative that he was from Quebec. He was he wasn't from the he wasn't from, okay. So we had to assert that fact, make sure that okay, he's this is well known. Having established that, and it is part of our cultural thing to, to be accepting of other cultures. But let me tell you one thing about, about the Haitian culture as well. You know that in, um, uh, in the school system, in Haiti's school system, we, um, we assign a large part of our history, of, 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 of Haiti's history uh, to the indigenous culture, indigenous history. Yes, Haiti's history did not start in 1804 when we won our independence from France. No, you go to all history books in Haiti, it would start even before Columbus arrived. Okay, with all those, with all the, the tribes, you know, the Tainos, the Awawaks, the, all this. And, and, and we had to study that in, in school. And as students, 
we would we empathized with the plight of the indigenous people with the with the indians the kind of atrocities that they had to suffer at the hand of the of the conquistadores so they had so we so we would we would I remember in in school we would we would okay we would bond with uh, a young and classic called Henry Cassie Henry was a young warrior was one one warrior and, and, and valiant I mean his valor his, his valor was well known he was feared by him because he was so so brave so so we would and 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 uh 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 would for him against the Spaniards. So they can, can win that. So it was with with a pain in our hearts when he said that okay, that culture was decimated. And so this is so we have that, so we are very accepting of and and you know the name Haiti in it was the original indigenous name of the country. Haiti was the I believe the, uh, 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 the Indian name, the original name, the, the original name of, of the land. After the independence, we didn't want to do, we want anything to do with our former, our former colonial power, with France. The name of Saint-Domingue, we wanted to get rid of it. We're not gonna, came, we're not gonna name the new country Saint-Domingue. Saint we would go back to the Indian name of Haiti or Haiti. So this is an Indian name. So, that's why, so we are very accepting of other cultures. So that's why the Saab and, and uh, having asserted the fact that, um, that, that he was of Haitian descent, now we open the whole thing to everybody like he did himself, like he did himself. So this is what, he, so this is it and that, um, so, so cultural acceptance, this is what it is. Cultural differences, he bridged all that up in his settlement. And that's why we want Disabled Park to be that place, that place where anybody who would get in, all right, before they get in, they would check, they do check out all their, pre all their prejudices out of the door, leave that baggage out of the door, get in it, get in the park and get immersed in that, okay, in the flow of, you know, of multiculturalism, okay? And, 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 then, be, and then when you come out of that place, you come out rejuvenated. I think you come out, ah, uh, we wired emotionally, we wired mentally to accept differences, to accept other cultures, to accept people, to respect people, respect other cultures and embrace them. That's what in, in my mind, in my dream, I see Disabled Park to be. That's why we're fighting so much with that because Chicago, can reconcile with itself through this Abel Park. So they come back to its destiny of diversity. Can that? This is where that can happen. The lesson that can be learned from this Abel Park. It will be an audio and visual place where you can hear, like, like in this Abel settlement, like it was like I said the other day at the event that we had uh, two weeks ago, that, that, that just the Sabo settlement was kind of a polyglot space, a multilingual space where, where in, in uh, uh, a Paduatomi language, side by side with English, side by side with French, with all other things. So we had that, you know, so we had that, that flavor, you know, of a, you know, of multiculturalism. How beautiful was that? So this is what it's gonna be. As a matter of fact, 
I had noticed Edzra's beautiful accent when we spoke on the phone a couple of days before our online encounter. And I knew we were going to discuss the cultural diversity and linguistic mosaic inherent to a city like Chicago. Edzra also insists that Chicago has a unique potential and history of acceptance. People from all over the world and of all walks of life do feel welcome in a city that Edzra Kantav wouldn't know so well and love so much if he didn't feel at home as a Haitian American. It has always encouraged Edzra to express his pride in his home country, which has adopted and kept an indigenous name rather than a colonial one like Saint Domingue. And its history doesn't start with the abolition of slavery in 1804 either. Etzer makes sure people understand that indigenous cultures and people had lived and thrived on the Caribbean island for ages, long before the arrival of the first Europeans. It might be one of the reasons why Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable was considered almost a chief among the native people of the area. But the key reason why Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable and the local natives got along so well is that the pioneer from Haiti was used to cultural diversity and acceptance. Haitians grew up with the clear notion that the history of their country is not based on the abolition of slavery way ahead of other nations in America, nor does it start with Christopher Columbus. It all began with the first inhabitants on the Caribbean island. Some native warriors and leaders are even considered heroes in Haitian textbook history a refreshing alternative to the Euro-American academic concept of history. So, Etzer Kantav tries to practice this heritage in today's Chicago with the idea of promoting cultural acceptance and diversity. And it is Etzer Kantav's cultural background that makes him a true Chicagoan with its contradictions and conflicts. But the third largest city in the United States has also stood out as a beacon of potential and possibilities throughout its history. Which part of you is Chicago? Oh, <laughs> uh, which which part of me is, is is Chicago? I think I have Chicago in me. By the mere fact, Dusab, Dusab was in Dusab. I have Dusab in me. Dusab is in me, and and uh, because as I said one day, okay, uh, Dusab's legacy is Chicago itself. It is Chicago. Whatever happens in Chicago, I mean, becomes automatically part of that legacy. Anybody who I mean, who comes to Chicago. Who decided to live in Chicago? You automatically. It's like it's like when you came to his settlement. You are embraced. You're that. So I'm Chicago. Okay, I'm that. You, you know, I'm part of that. So and, and um, my history is also I mean, the history of the smelling onion place as well. I embrace that. You know, and then uh, and and uh, and and there's not and we feel that. When Chicago is in the news, uh, not well in unflattering terms. I mean, we feel that in you know, in in, uh, in our flesh. We feel that. We feel that. I mean, in our psyche, that okay, uh, and and then we are rooting for the uh, for this for this is 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 city. Uh, so we have. So we have it in us, okay. So I have Chicago in myself, in me, because we decided we decided to live here, regardless of the cold weather, and that's one thing, well, because we left a warm country, and we decided to come, and that goes for Jusab as well. He came, we came to one of the coldest places in the U.S in the US and decided, and we all decided to stay. That because we had that connection with that land, 
we decided, you know, to make it our own as well. So we we are Chicago. That was it. Yeah. So we are Haitian American and we are also Chicagoans. So my online conversation with Edzo Kantaf conjures up all sorts of images of Chicago in my mind. They include destinations, attractions, and landmarks like those mentioned earlier. All those iconic places are located on or very close to what used to be Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable's settlement at the mouth of the Chicago River. And the whole narrative comes alive in the voice of a man by the name of Edzo Cantat. He is a great storyteller, weaving together the early history of Chicago, the history of Haiti, the general context of North America and Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries, and the biography of a pioneer who became the founder of Chicago. And there is a teaching in that story, cultural acceptance. That and open-mindedness are fundamental concepts capable of breathing life into any democracy. As a result, people's perspectives will also change and they might have or even work for a better future, whether it is in Chicago or anywhere else in the world. Postscript. A couple of weeks after my conversation with Ezra Kantav, I do an online interview with a poet, writer, and teacher by the name of Sharon McCollin. At some point, she and I discuss place names, their origin and meaning. Shara is quite curious about topics like that because she can associate them with her own cultural roots. Her heritage is Venezuelan and Jamaican, with some other nations from the Caribbean sort of thrown in between. So I mention Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable and the meaning of the name Chicago to her, which causes her to tell me the story about the origin of the name Jamaica. In recent years, they have uh, sort of rediscovered the real founder of Chicago, and he was actually from the Caribbean. He was a man, he was French-speaking, and he came originally from Haiti. And his name was uh, Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable. And if you uh, had gone to Chicago, there would have been a little settlement, mm -hmm. and they would greet you in the local Paduatomi uh, native language and in French Creole. In Paduatomi, it is uh, uh, Chicago, and it means fields of stinky onions. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I really do. Yeah. Um, Jamaica, by the way, uh, the native inhabitants, the original inhabitants were Arawak. And Jamaica is a returning of closer to the Arawak word for the, the country. So it was first colonized by the Spanish and became Santiago in its name for the patron saint. And then when the English took over, they anglicized the X-A-Y-M-A-C-A -A -A is the spelling that would be reflective of the Arawak um, origins of language. And um, now it's Jamaica, J-A-M-I-A-M-A-I-C-A. -A -A. Can't really spell when I'm in the air. J-A-M-A-I-C-A, -A -A, which is the anglicized version of Jamaica. You know, and so I think that's also really interesting to think about with Chicago, what you're sharing that, you know, only often only the European history is what we pay attention to still. And we don't think about the way in which language carries the trace, even of people who the, you know, the European colonizers largely decimated through disease and force and enslavement um, in this part of the world that you and I are sitting in. Um, but I think there's this desire increasingly, and I really love it, to talk about, especially the peoples whose land we're actually sitting on, who were the original inhabitants. Um, so where I am, it's the Susquehannock. Um, and you see a lot of um, the names of places that carry still that history. Yeah. So just another thread of language, circling back on this conversation about language, and even those histories that seem to be lost to us, there's often a trace of them. <laughs>